Hello, everybody. My name is Deepak Srivastava, and uh, I'm pleased to have you all here to uh, celebrate the 2017 Ogawa Yamanaka Stem Cell Prize. Uh, this prize is hosted by the Roddenberry Stem Cell Center at Gladstone. And uh, as most of you know, our stem cell center is most widely known for our work in the area of cellular reprogramming, ranging from use of this technology both for regenerative medicine uh, as well as disease modeling. And that, that work ranges from uh, cardiac regeneration to use of uh, stem cells for spinal cord injury, uh, other brain diseases and diabetes, and uh, disease modeling for a host of uh, cardiovascular as well as neurological disorders. And uh, a lot of the work in our stem cell center is really inspired by the groundbreaking work of Shinya Yamanaka uh, when he, with the ability to reprogram fibroblast to induce pluripotent stem cells. And Shinya had trained here in the 1990s, uh, moved back to Japan, and then was recruited back to Gladstone to start a laboratory in 2006, just as uh, IPS discoveries were being made. And of course, uh, this, this, uh, these discoveries uh, received were recognized by the Nobel Prize in 2012. <clears throat> this prize, uh, sponsored by a hero and his late wife, Betty Ogawa, uh, was really meant to uh, inspire and celebrate discoveries related to cellular reprogramming and uh, came about uh, both through Hero and Betty's uh, long association with Gladstone, first through uh, Warner Green and support with our virology and immunology center, and uh, then through a close, very close personal uh, uh, affiliation with uh, Shinya and Chika, his wife, who's here also today. And uh, they got, uh, were interested in recognizing in scientists anywhere in the world who were taking cellular reprogramming technologies and not just uh, using them for basic science, but also driving those technologies towards translation to make a difference in people. So this is a very unique prize with a very specific uh, type of uh, inspiration. And a hero uh, developed this through several years of service with the International Society for Stem Cell Research where he chaired the, a global advisory council made up of individuals throughout the world who had come together to try to enhance uh, development of stem cell technologies to help people suffering from intractable diseases. Uh, and so that was really the basis for this prize, and he wanted to connect it to Shinya's name and his discovery, and therefore we, uh, this prize is uh, called the Ogawa Yamanaka Stem Cell Prize. So before I introduce our winner this year, who's uh, Lawrence Studer, in more detail, I'd like to first ask Shinya uh, to say a few words, and then Andrew Ogawa, who's uh, Hiro's son, uh, to say a few words on his father's behalf as well. Shinya? Thank you very much, Deepak. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, as you just heard from Deepak, uh, we are very, very grateful to Hiro and Betty Ogawa for their generous, very generous support to Gladstone. Uh, actually, uh, Hiro and Betty have been our friends and also our mentors in many ways for the last 10 years. Uh, I remember it was uh, three years ago in April, uh, Betty and Hiro uh, came to my office in Kyoto and they started talking about this prize. They, their wish is to celebrate a scientist and also his or her spouse to make the new breakthrough possible. And, and I had a plan to go back to San Francisco in May, so I uh, told them, okay, let's discuss it again. Uh, next time I will be in San Francisco in May. But very unfortunately, just a few hours I landed in San Francisco uh, in May, three years ago, or Betty passed away. 
So this uh, prize uh, means a lot to me. It is really the last, very last gift from Betty to me and to our Gladstone community. So this year we have uh, Rollins and Vivian. I'm so glad to have you as the third winners, third winner of this prize. Uh, I would like to invite Andrew Ogawa, uh, one of Hiro's, Hiro and Betty's son, to explain more about this prize. So Andy, please. Thank you very much, Yamanaka Sensei. <clears throat> uh, yes, thank you very much for having me today. I'm representing the Ogawa family. My father uh, sends his greetings to all his friends here. Unfortunately, he can't make it today. Um, but many friends in this audience, and part of the reason why this prize was created was due to the friendship. Friendship between my father and my mother with Dr. Yamanaka and Mrs. Yamanaka and Ms. Ms. Uh, Dr. Deepak as well. And my father also obviously would like to congratulate you in person, but nevertheless, uh, congratulations, he says, to Dr. Uh, Studer. As uh, Deepak already explained in the beginning, you know, the reason behind the prize and Dr. Yamanaka kind of further enhance upon it. The point that um, I also want to uh, explain is that <clears throat> behind every successful individual, man or woman, there's a significant other or a spouse behind. Uh, that person supporting. And just as my mother supported my father and, and for him to be able to achieve his dreams, I believe uh, Chika Yamanaka supported Dr. Yamanaka in all of his uh, studies. And I also want to uh, congratulate Vivian for all the support you provided to uh, Dr. Lauren Studer as well. So um, with that, you know, thank you for attending today and uh, look forward to uh, hearing from you. Deepak? Thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> so uh, this year's prize uh, follows on the two previous years, and I should mention that in 2016, the first year of this award, uh, our committee awarded the prize to Dr. Masayo Takahashi, who was the first person to use an iPS-derived cell type in a human patient. Uh, and in 2000, that was 2015 and 2016, we awarded the prize to Dr. Doug Melton, who's the director of the Harvard Stem Cell Institute for his work in trying to use stem cells for diabetes. <clears throat> this year's recipient, Lawrence Studer, uh, is being recognized for his contributions to stem cell approaches for neurological disorders, particularly Parkinson's disease. Uh, Lawrence uh, is a native of Switzerland and received his uh, undergraduate and graduate training at the University of Bern in Switzerland. And it was there, even as a PhD student, where he began to use fetal cells at that time, before human embryonic stem cells were even possible, fetal cells uh, in transplantation for Parkinson's disease. He continued this line of work as a postdoctoral fellow in Ron Mackay's lab at the NIH, where he started right as human embryonic stem cells could first be cultured and was in a position then to uh, develop the first protocol to actually differentiate pluripotent stem cells into dopaminergic neurons. And it was there that he not only did that, but he met his wife, Vivian Tabar, who uh, was also working in the laboratory as a neurosurgeon. Uh, and they, this award prize, based on how you heard it was framed, is particularly unique this year because they have, in fact, been partners uh, for two decades now. And uh, Vivian has done a lot of the work in transplanting the dopaminergic cells into the brain. And uh, if I can announce, uh, she, we're also celebrating, uh, we can celebrate her for just being named as the new chair of neurosurgery at Sloan Kettering, uh, which is where Lawrence uh, and both have been since 2000. And currently, Lawrence is the director of the Stem Cell Center at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, and so the uh, Lawrence will tell you today about the work that he's done uh, from starting from that time to how he's managed to push the field, uh, first using pluripotent stem cells as well as iPS cells, uh, and relentlessly do the steps that it need that one has to do to actually get 
cells into a patient, which is not a trivial venture. And as he'll tell you, uh, hopefully this will happen in a clinical trial uh, in the next year. So Lawrence, congratulations, and we all look forward to he hearing your comments. Great. So it's a, a really wonderful pleasure to be here. And first of all, obviously, to thank Deepak for this very generous introduction, and also uh, to, to thank particularly uh, Hero and Betty and son Andy for really being here and representing the vision of this prize. That's indeed a, a really incredible honor for me to be selected this year. I'm also aware that obviously the work that's done is not just the work that's done uh, through my, my own work, but a lot of that work is done through the students and postdoctoral fellows, so I also obviously dedicate that prize to them. And in the vision of HERO, obviously also to Vivian, because as Deepak mentioned, we really have been partnered in life and a partner in crime, in science, to really do that for more than two decades. And sometimes I joke, we have two beautiful children that are now just about 14 and 16 years old. And this is actually our oldest child, in a way. <laughs> That's even older than that, and we hope that soon going to reach adulthood and actually help to hopefully benefit, benefit patients. And I also want to talk, obviously, Shinya, because he has been really a key inspiration for my own work and really enabled so much of the technology and I think also the, the sheer vision that actually things become possible that we were only dreaming, dreaming about many years back. So really what I want to do in this presentation is indeed focusing quite a bit on what we are doing in Parkinson's disease and how to translate that all the way to the clinic. But also, I want to give you a, another example which is not yet as far evolved, but an example that I think again illustrates the power of pluripotent stem cells both for modeling diseases, but actually at the same time also for cell therapy. And it's a little bit of a, a unique system as you will see. Now, just to start off, my lab is really interested in many basic aspects of pluripotent stem cell differentiation. And again, not so much in necessarily making the cells, which has now become a really quite standard procedure, again, thanks to Shinya's work. But really, once you have that cell, what are you going to do with it? Where can you really contribute? And obviously, one area that's very important is that you can understand human development in a dish. And this means that we can understand cell fate specification, so that how does the cell decide to turn into the myriad of cell types in our body? But also, how does the cell control time? What makes a cell different, a nerve cell different in an embryo or in an adult? And these are areas that we're very interested in that I'm not going to have too much time today to go talk about, but I think going to be very important for the future. On the other hand, obviously, once we know how to make the cell, we can see what goes wrong in that process in the context of disease and try to use the cell as a tool to develop novel drugs. And in the last approach, then, it's really no longer just the cell as a model system, but the cell itself being the drug. And again, I want to show you some examples on how we are going to do that. Now, a key tool that we've developed now more than eight years ago is a platform for differentiation that's now very widely used for the nervous system. And it's very widely used because it's really easy. So it turns out you can just simply take pluripotent cells and just add two small molecules and convert the cell that has the potential to turn into any cell type into a cell that is committed to make neural cell, mostly actually cells of the forebrain. And this has become a very robust platform for both disease modeling and for generating therapeutic cell types. And just very recently, in fact, we have published an updated version on that approach that extends it to make those cells under fully controlled condition, actually GMP-compliant media, to make again the central nervous system, brain, spinal cord, but also by just manipulating three more pathways, BMPs, WINs, and FGFs, you can actually make all the precursors of what's called the ectoderm, meaning neurocrest, the sensory placo that gives rise to sensory structures in your nose, in your inner ear, or even the surface ectoderm, the precursors of the skin. And so it's a very powerful platform, very defined, and hopefully very useful for the community in general. And the big vision to use such a system is obviously to really recreate the lineage tree that's available so that we can actually, over time, make potentially any cell type in the body. Many of you are aware of the efforts now to map every cell type in, in, in the human body by using single cell sequencing, and we would like to kind of do the reverse, 
recreate every cell type in the human body by understanding those developmental signals. By now we can do it for about 40 to 50 cell types quite routinely, and many of those cell types are interesting not only for study development, but are very, very relevant, obviously, to study a variety of diseases, some of which are mentioned here. For today, I selected, again, two examples, Parkinson's disease and the peripheral nervous system disorder, uh, which has to do with gastrointestinal function, which is something maybe you have less thought about, but I think is also very intriguing. So the nervous system of the gut is derived from the so-called neurocrest lineage. So these are cells that delaminate from the dorsal part of the neural tube and migrate very widely throughout the body. And in fact, they make a myriad of different cell types that are derived from those neurocrest cells. And over the last few years, indeed, we have developed protocols to make, for example, those mesenchymal cells that make the skull and the bone of your face, for example. We can make the melanocytes, which give you the pigmentation. We can also make better and better the, the glial cells of the peripheral system and obviously the various neurons that comp are comprised from peripheral neuron lineages, such as sensory neuron for sensing pain or sensation, the autonomic neurons, or in this case, the enteric nervous system. Now, the enteric nervous system I was quite fascinated about because it's really understudied and quite complex. So it turns out that in your gut, you have more nerve cells, more neurons than you have in your whole spinal cord. And it's actually a very, very complex structure. Developmentally, it comes from the, from the neural crest, and it comes from a specific region of the neural crest that is called the vagal neural crest and the sacral neural crest. Now, it's also interesting in the fact that it is not only very uh, numerous in number, but very diverse and it has a fully autonomous function. So there were these kind of somewhat nearly gruesome experiments done in the 80s, where animals were literally decelebrated. And it was studied, so can the gut still function without the brain? And the fact, the gut continues to have proper peristaltic, proper secretion. So it's a truly autonomous system, and it's obviously very important for motility, secretion, we're actually just now, about an hour before lunch, so it's gonna be very active very soon. It's also important for some of the side effects that you have for drugs in the CNS, such as drugs in antidepressive drugs that affect the serotonergic system, and it's very obvious why. Because 90% of the serotonin is not in your brain, it's in your gut. And so again, it has often, therefore, because of its complexity, called the second brain. By a good friend of mine, Michael Gershon at Columbia University, that wrote this very entertaining book, if you want to know more in detail about the history of the enteric nervous system. But one classic disease where enteric nervous system development goes wrong is Hirschsprung disease. Happens about in one in 5,000 children born, and it's largely a genetic disease. And the most common genes affected are two receptors, RET and EDNRB. And the only way currently these kids can be treated is if you literally cut out the part of the colon where basically you don't have an enteric nervous system, because otherwise what happens is you get a blockage the colon starts to bloat and to burst, and the child dies. Now, the surgery can be very, very powerful, but there are two problems. One problem is that the kids still, even after surgery, have typically lifelong complications. For example, they have problems with the sphincter function, which obviously is a big problem of quality of life. But there are also kids that have such severe forms of the disease that you cannot surgically treat at all. And so those kids can only be kept alive by IV nutrition and typically die within one or two years. And that's again a population where we hope in the future that we can actually move forward to offer those kids maybe something that could save their life. Now, I'm not going to go too much into the detail of how to make enteric nervous cells because we have published that last year. But just in a nutshell, you use these protocols that I mentioned you before, make neurocrest. But the tweak is you basically tell the cell to be neurocrest of the right region, the so called vagal region. And to do that, you give them a molecule called retinoic acid at the right concentration. And now those neural crest cells start to express a Hox code. That Hox code works a bit like a SIP code in, in, a, in, in finding an address. You know if you have a Hox code from 2 to 5, you know in the vagal region. If the numbers are much higher, you're maybe further down in the body. So we knew that we can make those vagal neural crest cells, and we did a lot of molecular studies to indeed confirm their identity. 
Now, for example, one property of those cells is that in the embryo, they can migrate very extensively. So you can inject them, as shown here on the left side, in, a, in an embryo uh, on the dorsal side of a chick embryo. So there's human pluripotent derived from chick embryo. They will migrate ventrally, and you will find that they actually take up shop in the gut. This is not just a random movement, because if you do the same process with other neurocrest, such as cranial neurocrest or melanocyte biased ones, they have a completely different migration route. Now, also, I told you it's a very complex system, many nerve cell types, and that's exactly what we see in a dish. So if you take those neurocrest cells, let them differentiate, they make dozens of different neurotransmitters that characterize the motor neurons, they are NOS and CAT expressing, or various interneurons to, again, create this diversity now from pluripotent stem cells. And you can use them in various ways. Here we just showed that if you mix them together with gut tissue, you can make organoid cells that then basically the pluripotent derived enteric cells, they home in into the exact region where they are supposed to home in, which is the so-called myenteric and submucosal plexus. And they're not just simply home there, but they can actually be functional. So you can show that by using a genetic trick, where with light, you can activate neurons called optogenetics. You build that into your enteric precursors, and now you mix them together with, for example, smooth muscle cells. So in this case, it's actually smooth muscle in the gut that gets innervated. We produce both of that by pluripotent stem cells. And now if you wait, and only when you stimulate, you see the movement. And if you are very patient, hopefully you can see kind of a peristaltic-like movement occurring on this left side. So it's actually different than, for example, cardiac contraction. And I know, yeah, now you can see, for example, it moves in this kind of coordinated fashion as a smooth muscle contraction. But maybe the most amazing feature of those cells is their migratory capacity. So similar to what the cells uh, are doing uh, during development, they can do that in a postnatal or even an adult colon uh, in a mouse. So you take those cells and inject them, in this case, into a region called the cecum, which is the most proximal part of the colon, and you will find that, indeed, after one hour, you can see the cells deposited at that site. But after two to four weeks, the cells have migrated nearly two inches within that colon to repopulate pretty much the whole length of the colon and starting to make a new enteric nervous system. And they expressed in a variety of neuronal markers compatible with their fate, and very subtype markers, such as serotonergic neurons, are very characteristic of those cells, and also make various glial cells. Because this happens at really high efficiency, and with very broad spread, you are wondering, is that good enough? That you can now take a mouse that has genetic predisposition for Hirschsprung disease and rescue the mouse. And indeed, we used, in this case, uh, this uh, spotted little uh, mouse model, and we could show that normally those mice die over a period of just a couple of weeks. But if you inject those precursors, you can actually rescue the mouse in nearly 100% of the cases. Now, Faranak, who really did that work in my lab, he, he has basically still more work to do with regard to the mechanism because these mice get rescued so effectively and so quickly that it's hard to imagine that this happens already by full integration of the neurons. But it's clearly a very powerful approach. And you can argue the mouse doesn't really care how it gets rescued, at least if it gets rescued, that's obviously a key achievement. Now, what I told you is these cells can also be used for modeling diseases. And we have now done both patient-specific iPS cells or pluripotent cells where we target the gene affected by Hirschsprung disease uh, by gene targeting. And we can show if you do that, in fact, in a dish, the cells also stop migrating, similar to what they do during development. And this is obviously a very, very simple assay where you can now test thousands of compounds to see can you find compounds that can rescue that behavior. And so we did such a screen and actually found indeed a number of compounds, and I just mentioned one of them, which is called pepstatin, which is a protease inhibitor. And you can see in a dose-dependent manner, it nearly completely rescues the migration phenotype that occurs, for example, in an EDNRB mutant mouse. Now, we did some mechanistic work and showed that also other, uh, uh, basically, protease inhibitors, such as base inhibitors, can partly mimic that effect. And we could show, using a genetic approach, that actually we can rescue that phenotype by inhibiting directly 
phase two, which is a very interesting target, as I don't need to tell people in this audience that are the Alzheimer's disease for a completely different disorder. And in fact, just very recently, I talked to Paul Tam in Hong Kong, who just recently found that PACE2 is actually often affected, or at least in a subset of patients with Hirschsprung disease, PACE2 itself is targeted in those patients. Now, the final piece of data I'm going to show you here is that you actually can now do the two strategies together. So we discovered a new drug that seems to improve migration in a dish, and we showed that enteric cells can migrate extensively, but less so if they have the mutation. So what we are doing here is, without even having to correct the gene, we just simply treat the cells before injection for three days with this drug, and then inject the cells after being drug treated. And this leads to another complete but quite effective rescue of the migration behavior. And so that's quite uh, an attractive feature because now, again, even if you don't know exactly the genetic background, you might be able to pre-treat those cells, give them a boost to actually get a better regeneration if you use patient-specific cells. So the conclusion then of this first story is that we have now developed a very powerful system to make the enteric nervous system in a dish, and that these cells are really quite remarkably good at migrating and, and basically can serve as a powerful model and also a treatment modality for Hirschsprung disease. Now, this is now an example where we are just at the verge now to see, are we going to launch the same effort that we I'm going to talk to you about the minute in Parkinson's disease to move that forward? Because again, there's obviously a very, very great unmet need for those children. And we think we know how to make the cells and really take that forward. So then I'm going to switch now to the second part, which is really Parkinson's disease. And that's a disease that has actually just this year celebrates, quote, if you want to call it celebration, 200 years of discovery. It was described first by James Parkinson when he watched patients walking down the streets of London and actually made an extremely accurate description of the symptomatology. It was actually only named Parkinson's disease by, by Char Charcot de Salbetrier many years later, who basically gave it the name in honor of the first description, this essay of the shaking palsy called the Parkinson's disease. But he did an amazing job in really describing in great detail all the various motor symptoms. Just to give you one flavor, it's obviously not only the movement problem that you most see when patients walk, but a very characteristic feature is, for example, when patients write. You see that they start writing smaller and smaller, and they start relatively big, and then they write smaller, and you can also see the shaking. It's called mi micrography, and it's one of the many motor symptoms that occur in Parkinson's disease. Now, the basic pathology is, is such that at least the motor symptoms are thought to be due to the loss of dopamine neurons in a very specific region of the brain called the substantia nigra, projecting into a region, particularly the putamen, that primarily controls motor function. And again, you see the myriad of motor symptoms that occur if those dopamine neurons have lost. Typically, the idea is if you lose more than 50%, of those cells, you start to get symptoms. Now, it's important to mention there are also symptoms that probably are not dopamine-related, such as patients often can no longer properly smell. They have certain sleep uh, dis disturbances and actually also an enteric problem, which is quite common. And again, pathologically, we can see typically these Lewy bodies that are used often for the diagnosis. You can see if you want to treat Parkinson's disease, obviously, you might want to know how Parkinson's work. And there has been a lot of progress in the genetics, and I just show you here a review recently from Andy Singleton, John Hart, who are the leaders in the field. You can see there's in fact a lot of genes that seem to be associated with the disease, either stronger or weaker, and a lot of mechanisms that might be involved in causing the death of those neurons. The problem is this hasn't really yet crystallized into actually practical therapeutic strategies. So you can make the argument again, the kind of the, the simplistic strategies, okay, we don't really know exactly how it works. So why don't we just try to put in the new cells that are lost in the disease? Often I use the analogy, you know, if a car breaks down because, for example, the tires do not work anymore, then what you do is basically you just simply put new tires in. You don't really worry too much why they got lost. You just simply put new ones in, and hopefully they last for many years to come. Now, that's a bit of a simplistic idea, but I think it still underlies a lot of the, the concept in, in regenerative medicine. Now... Parkinson's disease, clearly what we do know is it is a major global health problem affecting probably more than a million of patients in the U.S. alone. And we have a number of treatments, most notably L-DOPA treatment, which has been revolutionary early on, getting patients out of basically being completely immobilized. And again, that's clearly a big effort, and those drugs get constantly improved. 
But what happens as the disease progresses and dopamine neurons continue to die, the remaining L-dopa can no longer work very effectively, can no longer be taken up, converted, and released. And so therefore, it gets less and less effective, and we get more and more side effects. Another very powerful approach is DBS, or deep brain stimulation, that can be extremely beneficial to patients by not really putting in new dopamine neurons back, but trying to bypass the function by network activity. And that's, again, something that can be very, very helpful for patients, but it's also not suitable for all patients, and also typically gets less effective over time and has certain complication risks as well, because you constantly need to go back to readjust, you need to put a new battery in, and so forth. So it's you definitely it's not a one-job one deal, which we hope eventually cell therapy could be. Now, the motor symptoms, therefore, are still not perfectly treated, because, again, different technologies are continuing to be developed, and we think particularly at the stage when the patient is no longer perfectly controlled with L-dopa, when they start developing the so-called wearing off these kinesias might be a unique window where a cell treatment could hopefully interfere and prevent further progression, at least of the motor symptoms of the disease. Now, as you mentioned already a little bit, this is not a new idea to get cells back. There's a whole history of fetal grafting that I'm not going to go into great detail, but just to say those studies have shown that you can take cells out of an embryo, get surviving cells for several years, and cells that produce dopamine as measured by imaging, such as PET imaging. Now, when you look actually at all those studies, you find that overall they seem to somewhat work because, for example, the UPDRS, which is a clinical score for Parkinson patient, improved from here, which is a sham group in average, to the various treatment groups in the various trials done in about 300 patients by now worldwide. But this field really came nearly to a complete screeching stop a little more than 10 years ago when two placebo-controlled trials were published and showed that they both missed the clinical endpoint. They were just about close to efficacy, but they did not really reach it, and only in patients maybe that were younger, they had some beneficial effect. But I think what's even worse is they actually came down with graft-induced dyskinesia, which was something that was unexpected and always tells us we have to be very careful if we don't understand the system completely. However, what really happened is these patients were still there. I said 300 patients more were graft, and some were followed up now long-term, up to 15, 20 years. And remarkably, at least a subset of those patients, by 20, 25%, they seem to have done extremely well. What I mean by that is that they actually stopped taking L-dopa medication. And if you do this PET imaging in the brain, they had levels that were indistinguishable from a normal individual. And so that argued is, is something which you really don't see in Parkinson's disease ever, that this therapy can work. But how do we make it work more consistently? Now, again, there is an effort to actually try to see where we can understand fetal cells to make that better. But clearly, the future is not in fetal cells, but in a stem cell-based approach for some of the reasons mentioned here, that we really think we can truly replace the function permanently and really get, hopefully, uh, benefits beyond just dopamine release because we can restore the synaptic uh, function of those cells. Now, just uh, I allow myself, just in this talk, a little bit of a, a, a few back that, in fact, was, again, just to give you a little bit of a flavor of the long journey we had and how long it is, you can see, from the embarrassing haircut that I have at that, that time, which is an 80 times haircut in Switzerland, 90s in real time. But anyway, so, <laughs> so that, that it basically just tells you that that was the time when we started with fetal cells. And I realized, yes, it's an interesting approach, but you really need to have stem cells to really make that a routine therapy. It's just for ethical, practical, logistical reasons, not possible. That led me then again to Washington, Ron Mackay's lab, where we really started first actually with neural stem cells. And that worked somewhat, and again, the key contributor to that is actually Vivian, where we met or trying to count rotations of rats and really try to figure out how to get this therapy to work at the time. And so, but we really obviously realized with pluripotent cells coming along first in the mouse that that's the way to go. And we had, that was pre-Shinia years, no? so we had any single pluripotent cell you can imagine, mouse ear cells, nuclear transfer ear cells, partner genetic cells, we did everything, and everything actually seemed to work in the mouse. But look at the time, it's 20, 2003. So what did we do since then? <laughs> and so it turned out that actually, once we tried to translate that to human cells, there were unexpected issues, that the exact same protocols we developed for the mouse just would not work 
for at least eight, uh, for eight years. And I spare you exactly all the tribulations we went through, but we eventually figured out how to do it by understanding the development of those cells much more deeply, understanding that they come from a region called the floor plate, and then make cells that not only look like dopamine in a dish, but actually function in a mouse, in a rat, and can also function and be engrafted in a monkey brain. And so that was really for us the breakthrough of the technology and for the field to really have finally cracked the problem of making what seems to be the right cell. And this just gives you some flavor of how these cells then look in a monkey brain, so there's the human cells now uh, in a monkey brain after three months, you see how they have the exact same morphology as a normal human cell that was born in an embryo, and that you can do that in numbers where you get routinely about 100,000 cells surviving on the monkeys, each side of the monkey's brain. And that's about the number that you find in patients that did extremely well using the fetal grafts. We then wanted to show in many, many different ways that these cells really work, first in rodents, and you can see, for example, all these various assays where you wipe out dopamine on one side of the animal's brain, and you do then so-called rotation assays. And again, don't worry about the health of those animals, that's a highly sped up movie. So, but what you do is you, st you, stimulate, you stimulate the animal's amphetamine, and they start rotating around their own axis, and after you transplant, them, they basically stop this asymmetry. Or another typical assay you can use is shown here, where the animal basically has to balance its weight. And at the beginning, or shortly after grafting, it cannot really use the left pole properly. And it's not because it's paralyzed. It just doesn't know how to initiate the movement. And after transplantation, it uses again both paws equally. Now, this kind of assay shows you a nice correlation. It puts us in, the animal improves. But we wanted to take it one step further and say, can we also prove causality? And for that, we went back to this optogenetic trick. In this case, not to stimulate the nerve cell, but to shut it off. So you can now, in this case, not just in a dish, as I showed you for the enteric nervous system, but in an animal, you can control just the cells you grafted into the brain. Switch them on, switch them off, and see what the graft exactly does in a freely moving animal. And if you do that, we use that assay, which is called a corridor assay, the animal moves along a corridor, has food pellets on either side, the animal is hungry, it's going to eat all the food pellets 50-50, which is represented in this graph. Now, if you do that in a Parkinson mouse, it's ignoring largely the food pellets contralateral to the dopamine loss. So even though it could pick them up, it's like a hemi-neglect, it ignores them. So this assay can again be recovered by our pluripotent-derived dopamine neurons, which is great, yet another assay. But the main point of this experiment was really to show what happens now once the animal seems to be fully recovered to 50-50, now we shut off the graft. And what we see is that within a minute or so, the animal is again as sick as he was five months before, before he put the cells in. And what that proves indeed is that it's really the activity of those cells, the neural activity that's fully required, it's not an indirect effect, it's actual activity. And we showed pharmacologic, it's actually the dopamine of that activity. And again, for people that know more about uh, the physiology of the striatum, we did even more sophisticated assays, where you can show it's not just random release of dopamine, but you can show by doing precise electrophysiological recording that you can record from the cell that normally gets modulated by dopamine, which are these blue and red cells called medium spiny neurons. Those cells get input from the thalamus and the cortex, and that's what dopamine neurons are supposed to modulate. So what you now do is you stimulate a region called the carpus callosum, has those afferent fibers, you record from the blue and the red cell. And what you find is as soon as you shut off the light, the signal, the so-called amplitude of the signal you get in those cells drops by about 40%. And what that shows you is indeed the dopamine of the grafted cells at the exact synapse where these dopamine are supposed to act modulates the, their strength in a way very, very similar to what normal dopamine neurons do, even though they are grafted into an adult brain. But so that's enough now for the really basic aspects of this work. We are really interested in the translation. And so we are fortunate that in New York, we basically got an award that allowed us to really think to do that, not only in the lab, but actually moving forward towards clinical use. And it was a long, long process, and I'm not going to have time to go through all the steps. But obviously, you need to now make those cells no longer just in your lab, but in a sophisticated GMP facility. And we are quite fortunate that just across the street, at Sloan Kettering itself, we had a state-of-the-art facility where you can make up to 16 different clinical cell products in parallel. And so I had a very talented team, actually, for a postdoc of mine that got trained in the facility and very deeply involved and actually now translated the protocol 
to a GMP manufacturing process. And this was really a very arduous process of two to three years with a lot of regulations. Again, I'm not going to go into that, but just to give you a little bit of a flavor, for everything you do, every pipette you touch, you need to have a so-called standard operating procedure. So you have about 86 different standard operating procedures you have to do, you have to be tested, trained on, and you need to think about every single detail. And one of these kind of a little bit silly details, but the detail is that even the paper using the facility to write on has to be special, because when you write, you cannot have any dust occurring. So you really need to think about a lot, a lot of things in producing those cells clinical grade. But so we have now last year actually manufactured those cells in pretty large numbers. We made about 10 billion of those dopamine neuron precursors, which we estimate is the equivalent of what you would need for grafting about 1,000 patients. Now, obviously, we are not crazy and going to graft 1,000 people. Most of those cells are going to be needed to just simply be tested again for safety. And the advantage is if you have such a system that is very well characterized and we have very well pre-specified release criteria that were met in four independent runs of making those cells, so we could show reproducibly to meet exactly what we wanted these cells to be. And we also developed a freezing protocol where we can, obviously, there's no point in making cells off the shelf if you cannot store the cells. And so we have techniques where we can get very high viability out of those cells after thawing, and importantly, they remain viable even 8 or 24 hours, and that's very important for the surgeon. If you actually do the search, no, you don't want to have cells starting to die off during the procedure. Furthermore, we also have good stability of those cells long term if you just simply take new vials many, many months back. And again, there is many, many criteria, which, which I don't have time to go into it, but we had to develop obviously positive criteria that the cells have the right markers, but also negative criteria that these cells are free of pluripotent cells using very simple assays. And we have now much more sensitive assays than qPCR to really show that we can no longer detect any single pluripotent cell in that product. Equally important, if you work with a frozen dopamine precursor, can these cells work? Can you take a vial out of the freezer, thaw it, and directly inject into the brain? And it seems that's the case, because here we have beautiful grafts five months after transplantation, and we see again, like clockwork, the behavior of these animals improve the way we hope to see it improve, now from a frozen cell. And this cells, not only the cell bodies survive, but they reinnervate the brain. And you can see these fibers with a human-specific marker in red, overlaying with a dopamine marker, showing again far away from the graft to, prop, to, to lead to proper reinnervation. Now again, obviously, also in the US, we have a lot of regulations to deal with. And we have various meetings that we had to go through over the last few years, starting in 2014, to just simply talk about which cell lines we can even use to then show the FDA how we actually manufacture the cells, every single reagent we use. And we got more or less the green light with regard to those criteria as shown there. Now, what we are still having to do right now, the very, very final steps that's now just hopefully concluding, is that we take those cells, the thousand vials we've already made, and we go all the way back to the animals. And we actually graft hundreds of animals. We did more than 400 mice that have to go under tumorigenicity by distribution toxicology studies. And we had to add another efficacy study with those mice as well, and even a small uh, primate study to test the specific surgical device we want to use that you cannot directly test in the rodent. So still a lot of work that had to be done, but we're actually nearing the end of that. And if those studies are obviously positive, we would be ready to file our final documents to the FDA. And what we really want to do clinically is then to have a, a phase one study where we hope doing that at a single site, again, at, at Sloan Kettering, together with our partners at Wild Cornell, just across the street, and where the primary goal, by definition, has to be safety and tolerability. But obviously, we want to have an eye out for early signs of efficacy as well. We estimate that we, uh, we plan to have 10 patients to be grafted. These patients are about in the mid-stage of the disease. Again, I mentioned to you before this progression when L-DOPA doesn't really work perfectly anymore, and patients need to have additional treatment, such as TBS or any other treatment, where we think, again, our strategy could be hopefully a new alternative. We want to have two different doses for the patients, and again, those is based on our experience of what we think is needed from the fetal grafting field. And because we use so far a single cell line for all patients, we do a transient immune suppression in the brain for 12 months. We are pretty confident that we don't need to do that long term. Because again, fetal grafts have shown survival for up to 20 years. 
without immune suppression or with transient immune suppression. And then again, the surgery itself is done uh, basically stereotactically using a, an MRI-guided injection. And you might see here a blob, a white blob in this brain, where we actually, in this system, you can actually watch basically, and, uh, in this case, a solution to be injected into the region where we want to target the brain. And so it gives us high targeting precision, but even more importantly, it tells you very, very quickly, should something go wrong? For example, if you cause bleeding by stereotactic surgery, you could immediately see that, potentially abort the surgery so that the patient has much lower risk. So we think MRI guidance for surgery is going to be very, very helpful in this context. So then, again, we have been on a long journey starting nearly 20 years ago and having a major boost forward about seven years or six or seven years ago, but it's still a few steps to go. So we hope, again, that we can start our clinical trial now uh, in 2018. And we have now also uh, tried to find additional funding for that trial. And because New York State, unfortunately, is not really providing any money, unlike CERN, for the clinical trial. So we started a company around this technology that hopefully will help us to pay for this trial and also help us to take other products forward. Now, just last but not least, I want to also tell you that we don't do that in isolation. In fact, we started a couple of years back in 2014 a consortium called GeForce PD, where we have all the various groups, at least as we think the leading groups, interested in either taking embryonic stem cells or iPS cells to the clinic. And we had multiple meetings that were very, very collegial, very informative, where we learn basically how to deal with many of those issues. How do you test the potency of the cell? How do you have safety assays that you can present to the regulatory agencies and really hopefully together take this forward in a very safe and efficacious manner that could benefit the patients. In this context, again, this experience, I think, also drives me forward to hopefully take this as a paradigm for other cell products. I told you about the enteric neuron story. That is one such product that we like to take forward. But as the bigger community, if you remember the tree of differentiation, there might be many cell types where this paradigm could be useful and hopefully beneficial for many patients beyond Parkinson's disease. Last but not least, I have to acknowledge the many people that were really critical for this work. The enteric neuron work was pretty much exclusively done, at least initiated and pioneered by Faranak Fatai, who's actually now a native at UCSF, who became a Sandler Fellow right after being a graduate student. So she had really a quite successful stay and hopefully will do amazing future things here at UCSF. But then for the Parkinson's community, it's obviously a very broad effort that is there, and I cannot list all the various names. I just mentioned some of the key postdocs specifically that did the work. And from the key leaders, I wanted to make a shout out for Stefan Irion, who is the main manager of the Parkinson's project, and Mark Tomishima, who spent many nights, who actually for a while slept in the, in the lab to really get his cells manufactured at the time in a, in a safe manner over the last year. And last but not least, obviously, Vivian, who is really, I think, a key contributor and, can I say, call it partner in crime for nearly two decades. And I think we hope, obviously, that we bring that now finally to fruition after such a long time and to the benefit of many patients in the future. I think I would like to stop here and would be, obviously, very, very happy to take any of the questions you might have. Lawrence, and uh, thank you for a wonderful lecture. Uh, we have time for questions from the audience. Yes. We are webcasting this, so please, we'll have my questions on the microphone. So I, I, I'm wondering about your thoughts of um, the appearance of, of synuclein inclusions in grafted materials in patients and what that implies or doesn't implies for these kinds of treatments. No, I think that's a very interesting point, and that was basically discovered in the fetal grafts. Typically, what happens is that the first 10 years after cells are grafted, actually there is no Lewy bodies, no inclusions have been found. But after about 10 years, 10 to 15 years, they start developing Lewy bodies. And it's actually increasing and can be occurring in quite large numbers by 20 to 25 years. Now again, taking in, in account that, that I told you it takes 10 to 20 years, it might not be a big problem for our cell therapy approach, because obviously if you have a therapy that works 10, 15 years, and even after that stage, you have maybe 1% Lewy bodies, still many functioning cells, it's maybe not limiting. But what it tells you is obviously a very interesting thing about the disease, because those cells came from fetuses that likely didn't have Parkinson's disease. And so that's this idea of the prion-like transmission of the disorder, at least for in the context of generating those Lewy bodies. 
Now, if you're really worried about that, there are interesting ideas how to counteract that as well. With engineering, you can actually just reduce or even eliminate alpha synuclein in your cell that you graft. And that's if the prion hypothesis is true, it can actually not be propagated if you don't have alpha synuclein there. And the alpha synuclein null mouse is actually happy walking around. And so, again, I think it's not going to be an immediate problem. And should it become a problem, I think we have some idea how to engin engineer around it. Yes, Ken. Do you think these cells will be less susceptible to producing the dyskinesias? And what is your strategy if the dyskinesias do develop? Is there, what is the plan? Sure, that's obviously a very, very important question as well. So there's still no complete agreement on what really caused the dyskinesia. But the most prevalent hypothesis, it has actually to do not with the dopamine neurons themselves, but with contaminating serotonergic neurons in fetal cells. Typically, those crafts contain nearly as many serotonin than dopamine. The serotonin cells have the AADC that can convert L-dopa into dopamine. They can release dopamine, but they don't have the machinery to do that properly. And there were a number of studies done in patients that actually have graft-induced dyskinesia with serotonergic drugs, making that argument that those might be the culprit. If that's the case, then I think we have solved the problem, because in our graft, we have maybe 0.1% instead of 20% serotonergic neurons. Now, if it's another hypothesis is that it's the uneven distribution of dopamine in the brain, so-called hotspot hypothesis. That's, again, something we can try to address by a more broad dosing. But you're perfectly right. I mean, this, this kinesia was actually a big surprise when they came up in the first place. They were not seen in the annual model, so you don't want to be too confident that you know exactly how it works. And if it really were necessary, we would potentially have to have treatments against the dyskinesia directly. What you can do, particularly for dyskinesia, actually DBS can work pretty well. So it could be that you would have to do a combination of grafting and DBS should they occur. But we are pretty confident that the main reasons that are put out for the cause of dyskinesia, we can address in our stem cell-based approach, and therefore hopefully they will not occur. Maybe one more point, actually. There is that the other really important point is patient selection. So it turns out if you go back, all the patients that had severe graft-induced dyskinesia, they had already pretty strong L-DOPA, induce this kinesia beforehand. So you might want to avoid those patients. That's yet another, I think, safety switch you can include. Other questions? Steve? non-motor symptoms as well in PD, and I wondered if you foresaw any benefit uh, of this approach for non-motor PD. Yes, yeah, so at this stage, we haven't really looked at that in great detail. There are some hypotheses around very early cognitive problems that involve the prefrontal cortex that seems to be a dopamine-dependent dysfunction that actually patients might potentially benefit. Now, we, for example, don't think dopamine neurons will help in the late-stage Lewy body type disease, which is usually more different brain regions, but it's definitely an important point to check, you know, whether you get some kind of, a, by restoring more proper dopaminergic function, whether you get a broader network-like effect. But I think that's obviously maybe wishful thinking, so we don't really have good evidence at this stage. We need to do more work. But one interesting point, obviously, in this case, is maybe you can do combination approaches. One of the, it sounds trivial, but it's not trivial, one of the main complications or complaints patients often have, Parkinson's patients, is actually the gastrointestinal system. They have horrible constipations. Maybe the first part I show you, once we show it's safe in those very severe kids, you can do it routinely. That might actually help in those patients as well. They might actually be a good target population potentially. And so we'll have to see. But it's obviously a very, very important point to, to keep in mind. Uh, Lawrence, uh, for most cell types that we differentiate from pluripotent stem cells, they fail to fully mature. Is that an issue with the dopaminergic neurons that you generate? Is the maturity a, a, a problem or not? I think it's a problem for the patient <laughs> because they eventually do mature. But if you looked at some of those graphs, it takes months, even in the animals. And we think for the patient, we think that the first signs of efficacy we're probably going to see by about 12 months. The maximum will be reached by two to three years. And that's just simply because that's the normal development of those dopamine neurons during embryonic development to, to basically postnatal development. So it's a very slow process. And I think that is a limiting factor, but they do eventually reach full maturity. And because they are relatively immature, they might actually be protected from some of the problems that very mature neurons have in a Parkinsonian environment. So it's probably 
has good and bad aspects, but it's a very fundamental problem for many, many cell types, as you know very well. And I think as a community, we need to work very, very hard, not only to get the patient more quickly benefit, but more fundamentally to understand really what controls this slow maturation in human, for example, compared to a mouse. And I think that's a, a next major challenge where we need a real breakthrough. Yeah? That's fantastic. Great. If there are no further questions, uh, at this time, I'd like to ask uh, Andrew and Shinya to join me on the stage, and we'll present uh, Lawrence with uh, his award. Which is very heavy and I'll try not to drop. <laughs> so on, on behalf of the selection committee for the Yogawa Yamanaka Prize, which uh, is uh, made up of uh, George Daly, uh, who's the dean at Harvard Medical School, Hideyuki Okana, is the dean at Keio Medical School in Tokyo, uh, Marius Wernig at Stanford, and myself and Shinya, uh, we are pleased to present you this uh, award, which is designed and made by a local artist in San Francisco with the top meant to be the Waddington landscape, as you can see here, uh, which signifies the uh, cellular differentiation and reprogramming. So, Lawrence, congratulations on behalf of our committee. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. And, and, and Lawrence will receive the second half of his prize uh, later tonight. Uh, which is a $150,000 uh, personal prize. So, yeah. congratulations. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much for attending, and uh, I think the trainees uh, will have lunch with our speaker in a moment. <clears throat> oh, thanks so much.